Okay, thank you. Uh, meeting has recorded. It's starting to record. Okay, Holly, do you want to start off the introduction? Yeah. Yes, good morning, everyone, and uh, glad we're able to get together again, albeit by Zoom, unfortunately. <laughs> But I uh, just wanted to welcome everyone to the July 2021 Municipal Solid Waste Management and Resource Recovery Advisory Council meeting. Uh, we've got a, a nice agenda today that uh, we'll talk through some of the issues. And so with that, I will ask for Diane Barnes, if you would take role for all the council members. And if you want, uh, when she calls your name, just uh, please tell us uh, the area that you're representing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Trent uh, Perez. Scott Trebus. I have to unmute. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Trebus. I represent a, a solid waste uh, management organization specializing in commercial operations. Risa Weinberger. Good morning. Uh, I'm here and I represent the composting industry and also uh, environmental educators. David Yonke. Uh, I got a text from Dave that he's going to be running a little bit late this morning, so okay. he's tied up at the moment. All right, we'll check him. Okay, we'll check him in when he gets here. Okay, Heather Douglas. Heather, I know you're there. Are you muted? Did we lose her? No, okay. she's there. She's just on mute. Okay. Oh, she's having issues on her end. We'll call back in. Okay. All right. Uh, Holly Holder. Hi, good morning. Holly Holder with Park Hill in Lubbock, Texas, representing licensed professional engineers uh, working in the solid waste management field. Okay. Cody, uh, I get a chat from uh, Jeff Mayfield indicating that he was still locked. Cameron, Mike, or locked. Kevin Martinolik. Is Kevin here today? Cheryl Murgo. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Murgo with the Houston Galveston Area Council representing a planning region. Chuck Rivet. Good morning, Chuck Rivet. Um, a professional with experience operating a commercial solid waste facility. Okay. Jeff Mayfield, are you on? Did you, Dakota, did you take care of you yet? Cody, did you unlock Mr. Mayfield? I'm trying to find Mr. Mayfield in the chat, and for some reason I cannot see him. Uh, Mr. Mayfield, can you please raise your hand? And also, would you unlock uh, Scott Pasternak as well? I believe I just did. Okay. Okay, I'll go on to uh, Richard McHale. Good morning, Richard McHale with the City of Austin, and I represent officials from the city or county solid waste agency. Scott Pasternak. Hi, good morning. Scott Pasternak with Burns and McDonald representing the general public. And so I did get access for the audio but my looks like my camera is still turned off to where I cannot access it and so I think that's probably the same issue that others like Heather and Jeff are having okay Mr. Mayfield are you on with us now okay well I know you're here I'm going to mark you in and I know Heather is in. And Judge Dillard. Judge Dillard res representing counties underneath 50,000. Okay. 
Holly, I think we're I think we're good. Holly, you're on mute. I love this thing. Um, Diane, if you wouldn't mind, <clears throat> if you would go ahead and introduce the TCEQ staff that are present. And if there are any presenters uh, on the call, if you would like to introduce yourself after Diane introduces the staff. OK, um, Diane Barnes um, with the MSW permit section. And then um, Chance, I guess I'll let you go. Yeah, Chance Gooden, TCQ, MSW permit section. Um, Charlie, you're next. Good morning, Charlie Fritz, Deputy Director of the Waste Permits Division. And then Megan. Good morning, Megan Henson, Manager of Business and Program Services section. OK, I believe that's all that's involved in the um, and then, of course, uh, Cody. You want to introduce uh, yourself? Hello, I'm Cody Seal. I am with the Municipal Solid Waste Group, and I am the person who's trying to hold this shenanigans together. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Okay, Holly, I think we're we're good. Well, thank you, Diane, and uh, everyone, and Cody. I tell you what, dude. You know, hang in there, buddy. I know this is uh, one of those things that uh, you got all these people on the line, and you're frantically trying to get it. So I appreciate all you're doing and I know that that's not a fun job. So hang in there, you'll get it. So, uh, well, let's just move on the agenda and uh, Charlie Fritz, who's under the same tree she was under the last time. Uh, funny how that happens. Good morning, Charlie. And uh, why don't I go ahead and give you the, the podium? Oh, there you go. Go back to the tree, I, I prefer the other tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll switch it back. I'll, I can switch right. to blue bonnets if you want to. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Holly. Um, so yeah, just kind of um, update division-wide. Um, kind of got through session. I'm trying to remember. It was April, so got through session. Um, as you can see, I didn't include a session bullet point because there wasn't a lot of session-related bills for if that's for better or worse, depending on your stance, but we made it through session. Um, there was no direct MSW legislation that passed. Um, there were some agency-wide bills that we'll see um, coming along, and I actually did not even prepare an update for those, so um, it was just agency-wide things, um, but nothing le legislation-wise, so we made it through there, happy. Um, everybody took vacations or is taking vacations now since that's the usual par of the course whenever session ends is that there's mass vacations in June, July, and August. So that's what's going on now. Um, different than most years is we are actually, we are starting the sunset review. Uh, next year or next session, we'll, we are up for a uh, sunset review. And so we are starting that information now. We are working on our evaluation, internal evaluation report that we submit to the sunset committee and then they start their review, calling people, asking us questions. Um, they go through their process. So um, even though we have everybody's taking vacations, everybody is frantically working on our uh, internal evaluation report um, that is due to the Sunset Committee on September 1st. So we were working on that. They have not named who our actual Sunset Committee is for the agency. Um, so we don't know that yet. We are just creating the report and we'll submit that. Um, but looking forward at sunset, it's um, don't quite know what all the issues are going to be, um, but it's it's kind of what we've seen. I, I, there's going to be public participation, um, questions, uh, staffing, staffing issues, those type of things agency wide. I see a lot of MSW issues rolled up into those where it's, um, like I said, staffing, uh, across the agency. Staffing is important, trying to hire PEs and PGs in a very competitive environment on, unfortunately, state salaries has been an issue. So being creative and figuring out what to do about staffing um, and then permitting process, especially public participation uh, going forward is going to be a big agency-wide issue. So those kind of the 
agency-wide issues. I don't see a lot of specifics to MSW right now that we are going to call forward. Um, but it, again, Sunset looks at everything. So it's we're going through that process. Um, so you said that starts next session, so that would be in 2023? No, it starts, well, we will be review, like officially go through the review process next session, which is, yeah, okay. 2023. So we are doing, Sunset does all the work before that. Um, so we are starting, we've already started our evaluation process and have to submit it on September 1st, 2021. So in a couple months. So they do all their review from 2021, 2022, and then make their recommendation during the legislative session in 2023. Gotcha. So I, I, they hold hearings, they hold public hearings, and I believe that'll be next year. I think that's before, somebody can correct me, I haven't looked actually looked at the dates, but they hold public hearings, gather comments, call different agency or um, trade groups, interest groups, they, I mean, if you haven't been through a sunset, it's very in depth. Um, they wanna know everything about the agency, the public's view of the agency, interest groups view of the agency, regulate entities, environmental groups. Um, so they go through a very in-depth review audit pretty much of the agency and make a recommendation to continue the agency or not. So that recommendation is what they prepare for in for the legislative session, but they do all the work beforehand. So that's what we're going through, and that's what we'll be going through the next uh, year and a half. Have they named who will be the chairman of the review committee or? Not yet. yet. So we're waiting. Um, we'll imagine it'll probably be August to September when we hear that. Okay. Um, just got a notes from Heather and, and Jeff, I guess still having still having issues getting in. Um, so, uh, anything in this uh, special session? I guess it, from what I saw, it didn't look like there was anything solid waste wise. So, I guess that's why everybody's allowed to take off on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I heard there may be um, um, radioactive issues, but not municipal solid waste, not hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about Sunset? And if you're not able to access your mic but want to say something, you can type it in chat or um, yeah, or save it to when we actually when you're able to get your mic work and we can come back and I can answer any questions as well. Okay. For, Anyone have a question for, for Charlie? Risa, was that you? No. Real quick on coronavirus update. Um, the agency is starting to move back forward to um, normal operations we have lifted our we had limits on number of staff in the building uh, we've lifted those so um, but we're still not requiring staff to if they can work from home we can still work from home um, that's kind of this interim and during the summer knowing um, still need to get everybody um, it's the summer kids aren't in school vacations so we're just kind of doing this in the interim don't have a plan for september 1st yet um, and know exactly what that's going to mean. I imagine we will have telework days. We will have in the office days, um, but don't know the exact number. We are starting right now, even in the interim, to start allowing um, external people to come into the building and select cases. Um, so we can start meeting with people, but it's one of those that there's it's not as just, it's not right now, it's not as easy as just coming into the office, scheduling meeting, coming to the office. We do have procedures for health screening for external parties, um, spacing requirements, all those types of issues. So it's not, it's not a streamlined, it's not as just walk in the office and have a meeting. So, but we can in certain situations, we still highly, um, just for ease of scheduling, um, still highly encourage these teams meetings, um, but let us know and so we can start facilitating. So we're starting to return to normal, but it's still, uh, we're still in an interim period right now. So if uh, if someone wants to have a pre-permit meeting with you guys in the past, you know, we've come down and, and sat with members of staff. So I guess now you would encourage those to continue being by a team's meeting? Yeah, because it's really, I mean, we've seen a lot of benefit of, we understand like, yeah, it's great to be in the same room as people. 
Um, but we see a, we've seen a lot of it takes a while to schedule that. Um, so if everybody's in Austin, it may not be that big of an issue. But a lot of times people aren't all in Austin trying to get people scheduled for coming in um, is difficult. So that's why, I, like, if you want to get something scheduled a lot quicker, highly, highly recommend um, just letting us do it virtually, do a virtual meeting, and we can facilitate that a lot quicker. Um, like I said, especially in this interim period right now, trying to schedule an in-person meeting, it expect probably a week or more just so we can get all the, we can figure out the requirements, we could get you external parties, walk you through what your requirements are before you can even enter the building um, and those those steps as well. So it's doable, well, but yeah, go ahead. As a follow up, I guess it seemed like after it was at the 2019 legislative session, and this may be uh, a question for chance as well, um, where you guys were going to uh, attempt to come and visit a site that you're permitting for the first time or maybe doing a major modification. And obviously, uh, the pandemic, you know, put the brakes on that. But I would sure like to encourage that uh, that process not be lost as we move forward. That I think that's that's vital, particularly in the areas that are away from Austin and Travis County, where these guys live and breathe. That get out into the other parts of the state and see those those permits that uh, they're working with. So don't know where that is, but just uh, really want to encourage us you guys to continue that program when this thing finally yeah. uh, gets in the in the back seat yeah and actually we have um we haven't the agency as an agency as a whole we we continued to do that site assessment um it was just the regional office staff that we asked the regional office staff to go out and visit the site use our checklist to um go through the items that need to be checked now that All we're right. starting to return back to normal yeah we will we will um, be the ones traveling, unless we're short on budget, uh, we will be the ones traveling out to the site doing the site assessment ourselves, per permitting staff, um, and only in extreme situations would we ask OCE to fill, fill in that step. So right. it's, we just haven't had that many. I think we had two that we asked during this, during the corona, during last year and a half, we had two sites that we asked OCE to want a couple of chance can fill in the details if I completely miss on the two. That's all I got. Okay. No, that, uh, that's anyone, right. Anyone else have any questions for Charlie? Sounds like there are none, Charlie. So thank you very much. Uh, good to see you again. And yep. I will I'll turn it over to uh, Chance Gooden. So uh, not seeing you, Chance, but hearing you, buddy. So uh, you yeah, have the comment. You're just gonna. <laughs> you're just gonna hear me today. You can see my picture there. Um, so before I get into those updates that you see there about rulemaking and, and uh, guidance and forms, stuff like that, uh, as normal, I was going to give you an update on staffing and projects. So uh, if you take a look at the org chart that's in the backup material that um, was sent to you guys, uh, there's a, there's a, a July 2021 org chart. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Be good. Okay. So, uh, uh, if you take a look there, you see that we have two team lead positions that are vacant, and a ge uh, a geoscientist, a geologist that's vacant. Um, but uh, you know, as soon as you get you know an org chart printed, you get more news. So we actually have another vacancy coming up, uh, an engineer position, and 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 another uh, probably, well, another project manager as well. So uh, the last time we met, we had five vacancies, but we have filled those vacancies since we met last. And with J uh, Jason um, Baiocchi is uh, on there. I may have botched that last name. And then Bob Pedersen, um, um, he's an engineer. We got that filled. And we also have an intern uh, for the summer. His name is Westman. And then um, uh, David Flores, um, he he's come on the board and project manager. And then lastly, uh, Victor Garcia. So um, we're just a revolving door 
explore here lately. So we're just going to keep our heads down and continue to do what we can to keep our positions filled. Um, like Charlie was saying, um, our main focus um, uh, for uh, Sunset is really just, you know, staffing and um, public participation. So those will be front and center for me. It's just, you know, growing staff, getting them um, what they need, the resources they need to do the job and um, so we can keep the efficiency going that we've been um, having in the program so if there's ever any you know concern with things please reach out to me and make it me aware of it so I can focus on that um, but, but uh, that's my goal this coming year is to make sure that staff uh, grow quickly and efficiently so we can carry on, on what we've been what we've been doing in the program. Uh, in regards to projects, the last time we met, um, there was 21, we were up a few. We got 24 major projects going on right now. Five of those are registrations. So uh, that those are our main projects. It doesn't include our reports or modifications or NOIs that we, we readily do every day. So, um, uh, so that brings me to rulemaking projects. Uh, we have a project going on. If you haven't been hey, watching, Janet, we uh, yes. Janet, may I ask you just a quick question? I apologize for interrupting, but I just wanted to get a de your definition of major projects. I guess not all of those are new permits. Those will be permit mods and amendments. Could you be a little more specific on uh, that? They, yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's new new permits, major and a limited scope. OK, and registrations. Yeah, those are the major. Those are the ones that have basically they have notice and uh, public um, contested case hearing opportunities. So you don't have the other number ones that, of how many new permits there are. Oh, we have. Um, 20 just the permits. Um, I don't I didn't get the breakdown right in front of me, but no, not just the permits. If I were to say I would say probably 10 of those or probably eight to 10 of those are new permits or amendments or limit gotcha. scope. Yeah, um, I know of I know that we have if you're talking about greenfield like new greenfield, that is two. OK, that's two. But the others are like. Uh, major amendments or limited scope amendments that they have the same opportunity that a new permit has when it comes to public participation. Oh, yeah. You know, you have the public meetings and the contested case hearing. So, um, and then the other ones are registrations. So, those have the uh, opportunity to file a motion to overturn. So, a chance we okay. actually have we actually have four. Four new permits. OK, all right, good. Yeah, yeah. All right, Just great. FYI. Thank you. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. No, not a problem. Um, thank you, Diane. Uh, no problem. So and uh, on the rule banking, uh, we're, as you remember, we're doing uh, some cleanup on the composting rule, Chapter 332, and we're set. We're currently set for July 14th uh, to propose that rule. So everything's on track and uh, we'll be uh, um, right now as of right now we're holding a, a public public hearing, but it'll be virtual public hearing on on the uh, the rulemaking. So um, right, it's right now scheduled for August 23rd uh, at 2 p.m. So when that gets depending on what happens on the 14th, that'll get announced and and get set through the Texas Register. Um, in regards to guidance and or forms that we've updated since the last time we met, uh, I talked to you about some things that we were doing for the sub T um, program, trying to get some frequent, frequently asked questions um, uh, available on our website that we come across a lot with uh, applicants. And I'm pleased to announce that's finally happened. So we we have a we have a page dedicated to um, some uh, helpful information on, you know, preparing and submitting that application and the requirements for developing over a property. We go through things like, you know, how you do your 
your uh, public notice and um, what you're supposed to gather and data wise to submit. And so that is out there for your perusal. Um, it's it's under the MSW landfills uh, closed uh, constructing over a closed landfill page. So you'll find it there. So we also actually put it out there. Those that are signed up for our newsletter, it's also provided there. So if you want to look there as well. Uh, I, I wanted to bring you all probably all know this, but EPA's national recycling goal. Um, they they had a, um, a summit in 2020 announcing their goal to increase the recycling rate to 50 percent by 2030. Um, there's a there's a handout, I think, that was attached to the email we'll insert about their goal. So you can read that and go to the website, but I just thought it was interesting and thought that y'all would uh, if y'all didn't know about it um, that is that is happening and they want to reduce the contamination in recycling even more um, make the recycling process more efficient so um, strengthen the market there so um, I don't really have anything to add to that other than um, that's all you know just bring it to your attention if someone wants to talk about it, we can talk about it some more. But um, I can I think it kind of goes into some of the things that, you know, we do for the the uh, recycling market development plan. Uh, David Greer, uh, he couldn't be with us today, but um, he did tell me that the project's still ongoing and is on target to can be to be completed by the end of the fiscal year. So after that, the summary of those results would be presented probably at the October Council meeting. So, Scott, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think that's the key summary right there, Chance. So, like you just said, we're okay. still we have essentially one one more section that um, is in the works. Everything else has been either submitted and approved by TCQ or you know, is in the review process. So as you mentioned, we're still working on it, but very much on track for the end of the fiscal year deadline. Great, great. So um, so um, that's that's all I have in regards to update for MSW. Um, anybody have any questions for me? All right, great. Um, turn it back over to you, Holly. Thank you, Chance, and uh, appreciate all you do and all your, what your team does. And uh, thank you for uh, continuing to update your org chart. It's always good to know where everybody fits in the slot. So, looks like. Uh, well, if you have anybody out there in the market that's looking for a job at the state, send them my way. <laughs> Did you say that you had one engineer position about to open up? I am. Okay. Possibly. All right. Well, if I hear of anyone, we'll send them your way. Well, like I said, uh, Dave Yonke has joined us now. So good morning, Dave. Hey, guys. Good morning. Sorry I'm late. I had a client call. Okay. okay. So along next, uh, Megan, good morning. Uh, got your uh, microphone off and uh, you're the manager of the business and program services section, so uh, we're ready to hear your update. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You may remember that I talk tires usually um, at past meetings, and now my scope has broadened slightly, but tires is still in there, so not changing too much. Uh, so just a quick update on the Miserac Council position applications. We have received the applications, and they're under review. And the selections will be presented at the commissioner's agenda on September 22nd of this year. So they should still but the uh, new members uh, will be able to attend the October meeting. So if you're interested, um, we will post, you know, the Texas Register, the required documents and uh, also, of course, the commissioner's agenda will be September 22nd. That's it for council update and uh, moving on to the regional solid waste management plans. Hey, Meg, Megan, yeah. Megan, before you go on, can you just remind us 
um, I think there were there was an email that was sent out recently. There was like three positions that are still vacant. Is that right? I believe it's two that we did not receive two? any applications for. OK, were they both but elected can, officials or? I believe one was an elected official, but I can look into that. Those three have traditionally all been elected officials, so it wouldn't surprise me. If it was yeah, in the we'll email, yeah, no need to re to respond back. If, if it's in the email, I can look it up again. OK. Yeah, I understand the elected officials have has been a struggle uh, filling those positions, so we are exploring ways to get the word out and and get in contact with people, you know, elected officials that may be interested and be able to participate. So for the regional solid waste management plans, the COGS continue to work uh, on these plans and TCQ held some Q&A sessions with the COGS um, and small groups throughout the development process. And now we're on a helping on a one on one and as needed basis. So the COGS are doing a great job on those and we're expecting for the first plan to be submitted in August or September of this year. So right around the corner, we'll we'll get to see those first plans. Hey, As, uh, oh, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. Who's the primary contact uh, at TCEQ that's working on coordinating and reviewing the plans? That would be Cheryl Untemeyer. Okay. Thank you. That's what I assumed. So, Megan, when they come in, um, and and by the way, uh, kudos to you guys for developing a one format for all the plans to fit under. I, I know in the past in working with those, how you would pull up one COGS plan and, and you go to another COGS plan and they're like entirely different documents. So I think the way you guys structured that to where everybody works within the, the that framework of the forms that you submitted, I think is going to help you guys uh, down the road as you as you pull that data together you won't be banging your head on the wall trying to find it from going from one cog to another um, so when you said uh, the first one's going to be submitted in the fall then um, what would be your review process will you be reaching back out to the cog with questions or what how do you envision the the second phase as these things start coming into your to your offices yeah, that's a great question and thank you for the the compliments on the the new structure. We think that's actually going to help quite a bit with the review process and like you said um, later down the road when we need to refer to these plans. So what we're anticipating is doing a preliminary review uh, just to make sure all the sections are filled out, the attachments are included. If we see any big items missing, reaching out to the COG again and saying, hey, you know, there's a couple of gaps in here. And then we're going to have a more detailed review, and that would be with um, the the COG team that we have, as well as MSW for some technical input and with the um, Office of Legal Services providing their input as well to make sure that the rural requirements are met. So we're looking at um, our goal is to have the comments and if anything's missing, getting back to the COGS within 30 days of receipt. And we'll have a better idea once we get the first plans in if that's a reasonable goal, but because we have you know, we haven't done this in 20 years, so we're we're uh, I don't want to say we're making it up as we go along, but we've got a plan in place and once we get some in, we'll know how efficient that plan is going to be and how effective. So and then um, having about a couple weeks in place for the COGS to provide comments and responses to any of the deficiencies that we find. And then from there going through the approval process um, for the different uh, ver uh, volume one and volume two. One is ED delegation and one is um, sorry ED approval and the other goes to commissioner's agenda. So we're looking at hopefully having from when we have it approved till it's or sorry when we have it in house to when it's approved being about anywhere from three to six months depending on again the back and forth that we may have um, but also going through the commissioner's agenda process. So you'll will you take those individually or will you wait and get them all and submit them in one package to the commission? We're looking 
to take them in batches um, a couple at a time. We're going to see again um, <laughs> how this works out. Uh, but yeah, the idea is not to take 24. That would be quite a lot. And we're trying to um, space them out so they will be going in in small groups to the commissioners. OK. Hey, good morning, Megan. This is Scott Pasternak. So thanks very much for, for the update. So you know, I heard what you said as far as the, you know, the, you're expecting the first one to come in, you know, sometime in the next month or so, but can you give us a sense of what the deadline is or as far as when the COGS are required to submit the plans to TCQ? So we have, um, we don't have a, I guess it should be within 2022 um, as far as a, a policy or you know a drop dead date we haven't really established those it seems like the cogs have been um, very open sorry i think i'm getting some feedback um the cogs have been um op communicating regularly it doesn't sound like anyone's going to be um you know up against the deadline december 31st 2022 it sounds like most of them will actually be in around january or february of 2022 um mm -hmm. But we we can I can get back to you on that again. Be, we don't have a drop dead date right now um, and we want to work with the cogs. If there is someone, uh, if there is a cog that looks like they're going to be pushing up into the. The fiscal year 2023, then we may need to evaluate. Uh, their timeline. OK, that's very helpful. So thank you, Megan. Sure. Any other questions? All right, and uh, just thank you to all of the COGS who have been working uh, on this and we have great communication uh, with Cheryl, Brenda and Anju and the COG, uh, COGS as well. So we just appreciate all the input. Uh, this is definitely a, a team effort to get these done and for the for the review process, what's going in, uh, just a lot of good communication and and feedback as what TCEQ needs to provide now and in the future. So we appreciate all the work that the COGS are putting into this. All right, for the scrap tire program, we published the 2020 annual report yesterday and the uh, report is available online. And this year we actually did have an increase in the number of uh, registered transporters and scrap tire facilities who reported. So uh, 155 transporters and 103 scrap tire facilities and storage sites. So that's good. We were kind of getting worried. I think COVID did um, play a role on people even remembering to submit an annual report in, uh, in 2020 for the 2019. Uh, but we did see an increase of scrap tires that were managed and we're up to 47.4 million tires managed in 2020. Then I believe in 2019 it was around 45 million. So we we saw that steady increase that we've been seeing for the past few years. And one thing that's new to the annual report is we do have a section now on implementing the five year plan for the scrap tire management in Texas. So you can see what the scrap tire program did and we just cover highlights um, related to the plan, like the workshops that we held, um, different resources that became available. So feel free to to learn more about those in the report. Hey Megan, would it be possible for you to distribute that to all the, the folks on the MISRAC? I'm not saying I couldn't find it on TCEQ's website, but uh, it might be a little quicker if you send it to everyone. Absolutely, we can do that. Thanks. There you got some. Looks like Cheryl gave you kudos, so good job, Megan. <laughs> All right, does anyone um, else have any questions for Megan on the, the, the COG plans or the uh, tire program? I guess not. So Megan, great job. Thank you very much for coming in this morning and uh, presenting that. And we look forward to hearing from you down the road. So uh, thank you. Have a great rest of your summer. You too. All right, we'll move along. And uh, so Chance and Diane called me and 
we were discussing potential agenda items and we kind of went back and forth whether or not to put this on for the COG because this doesn't apply to everyone. It's uh, primarily those that uh, operate or work in the engineering field with uh, municipal solid waste landfills. But we thought it would be a good idea just to let everyone on the uh, advisory council know uh, what's going on in case they have questions or hear any comments from uh, people within uh, their municipalities or, or counties. And so uh, looking for uh, you guys to kind of chime in uh, that operate landfills, but basically what has happened is the EPA uh, went forth and, and changed their uh, air emission guidelines related to, uh, to, to uh, was it, I guess it's the non-methane organic compounds. They lowered the threshold from 50 megagrams per year down to 34, and it's going to impact a lot of landfills across the state. Um, the, um, so the new, force, new source performance standards that were in place were revised, and I believe they were revised uh, uh, back in June. They were issued in, uh, around the 21st of, of June, if I remember correctly. And it's going to affect landfills that uh, commence construction on or before July 17, 2014, and that haven't been modified or reconstructed since then. The implications for a landfill uh, depending on their uh, design guidelines and their uh, uh, the quantity of waste in place, it could mean that they're going to have to install some kind of gas control system much earlier, much sooner than what they would have normally had under the, the previous rule, which was 50 megagrams per year. Again, they have lowered that, that threshold. And uh, Texas is unique in that we're not an approved state as of right now. So Texas as a whole is going to come under the uh, purview of the EPA on this until which plan that Texas has an approved plan. I think right now there's only a half a dozen states in the country that actually have approved plans. The nearest one to Texas is New Mexico. But from what I've seen on that plan, it pretty well mirrors the EPA rule. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there and didn't know if any uh, anyone that operates uh, landfills or works in gas systems wanted to weigh in on that just to kind of let everybody know what you're seeing, especially if you operate a facility. So I'll kind of throw that open. Hey, Holly, it's Scott. Um, Hi, Scott. Good morning. Yes, uh, we, we've been having several conference calls at Republic concerning that new rule and and um, obviously we're trying to figure out what how that impacts our landfills and what we would need to do going forward. I think one of the other big impacts and I think it's quad A is um, doing the penetration surface emission monitoring. Uh, the other guidelines was a um, you know a serpentine pattern. Um, now with this new rule uh, along with the new megagram total it's looking at all penetrations that occur through the cap. Uh, that you would have to monitor. So um, at least that's a guidance I've received. So we're, we're still looking into that new rule. So uh, I think stay tuned. We'll uh, I'll probably have a little bit more updates later on through that throughout the year. Anyone else have anything they'd like to weigh in on that, Jeff? I, I, I was simply going to kind of add on to what Scott was saying that you know, as a result, probably you'll see going forward when there's gas wells installed, if, you know, historically you didn't have a geomembrane type boot um, affixed to the riser, that's probably going to be very common going forward just to, you know, to address the penetration issue. Can, can someone explain to a finance non-engineering person like, is this uh, affecting landfills that are say over three or four taking three or four hundred thousand tons is it due to how deep they are or what i'm just thinking from a standpoint of cities we work with that have landfills do they have to start setting aside money for this and is this half a million dollars a year is it o m capital what 
what's driving this and the impact? Yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll, Scott, Scott, would you gonna weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a couple things. So obviously it's the uh, size of your landfill and it's also your emission rate. So um, there, there's the PA guidance on how you calculate what your emissions are gonna be projected. And as soon as you uh, go over that value, um, then you become applicable to the rules, typically. Um, you know, there are like, um, you can do tier two testing to show that your emission levels are lower, which if they are lower, then that might delay when you come into that process. Uh, but um, because it went from 50 down to, I think it's 23, uh, it will impact a lot smaller landfills. Um, and it, it's not really a tonnage rate per day, it's your capacity and when you, when you achieve over those emissions. So it's so, actually the design capacity of that facility is kind of what starts the whole process, Dave. And, and, and yeah, so like Scott said, it's gonna drive this down to smaller facilities and it's going to shorten the time that say a landfill that's been open for 10 or 15 years and hasn't hit those numbers yet since they're lowering that threshold now it means they may come into have to come into compliance and I forget the time frame that they have but it's not that long where they have to install a gas collection and removal system so it's going to have a financial impact on on these facilities, uh, they're going to have to come up with the money to pay for that because it's uh, by the time you drill wells, run uh, header piping, tap it into a to a flare system, you know it gets pretty expensive pretty quick. So, and not only that, Holly, the uh, the costs related to doing operations and maintenance. Um, so going out and doing the tuning uh, twice a month, and then going and doing any repair work, um, it, it's could be a significant number. And I would imagine some facilities are going to have to train people because they haven't had to operate a system yet. And and like you said, Scott, you know, that you, you it's not just a plug and play. Once this thing's up and running, you walk away from it. It's a continual process of of monitoring the wellheads, checking the gas flows, um, you know, making sure everything is running. There are no leaks in the system. It's so it's going to require cities that haven't had the staff trained to do that sort of work to step up and have to create new positions. So, or it's a good time to be a consultant in the. <laughs> so if you have a, a gas recovery system for energy, are you less likely to be triggering this because you are doing that? Then it's only those that don't have gas mm -hmm. recovery. No, it doesn't matter if you have gas recovery. I mean, we have high BTU plants um, all across the country where obviously we're turning the uh, methane into uh, processable um, gas, but you're still applicable to the rules. And in fact, when you do have a recovery system like that, it's, it's a little bit harder to achieve those targets, mainly because it, when you do high BTU, you're trying to look for a higher quality of gas. Thanks. Does anyone else have anything to say you'd like to add? Uh, just kind of say what uh, Scott said. Yeah, EPA is very good to consulting engineers from time to time. So. Charlie, did you want to say something? Yeah, so you click? I had a question uh, about the tier two testing. When we were going through the audit with uh, EPA's attorney general, they had only said based on capacity. So is the tier two testing new as a way as a is that I guess is that new or has that always been there? And if it's always been there, have a lot of landfills taken advantage of it or are most just going based off capacity? Yeah, it's it's always been there, Charlie. And basically it's when you when you do your tier one estimate, you're using AP 42 values, which is a higher um, average emission rate. And so with a with a um, Tier two tests, you can do two things. You can either do uh, boreholes into the landfill and do actual grab samples uh, from the landfill, which is quite expensive because you got to do it over the uh, lot, a bigger portion of the site. Or if you do have an active gas system, you could pull that out of the right where it goes into the flare uh, near the blowers and then do what's called a modified tier two. And all that's going to do is give you an emission value 
and then you compare that to the EPA 42. And if it's a lower value, you can plug that into your emissions level, which may uh, delay the time that you have to become uh, in that regulations with the EPA. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Tar we've been doing tier two testing on specific sites that that busted the original design capacity um, for t nearly 20 years, I guess. I mean, we've done some, uh, you did them every five years and we've done uh, one site three year, three different times now. So it has been around and it's it's gonna expand that now to landfills that have not had to do that. Okay. Okay, good to know, thank you very much. And and I didn't know if TCEQ, if, um, if you guys have had any conversations as far as is there any plans for the state to adopt a statewide plan, or are you just going to let the EPA uh, the program be the one that uh, that, that y'all follow? Yeah, um, I reached out to Air Permits Division about it, and uh, they are looking at it. They're looking at the recent court actions and the EPA rules, the new federal plan, and they're going to be working towards a state plan to implement those things but they didn't really give me a, a timeline on the proposal date or any details right now, but that is that is something that they are looking at. So basically right now, states, uh, facilities in the state will have to comply with the EPA rules until you guys say otherwise. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, they talk about if, if they enforce it. Uh, that's what it says that, you know, that's really where it comes back down down to their enforcement of it, so. Hey, Holly, uh, yes. question. Has, uh, has EPA or TCQ identified the landfills that would now be affected by this? I think it's up to each individual landfill to do that design capacity analysis themselves. Um, Scott, you, Chuck, uh, is that how y'all understand it? But I, I think that's the way it is. They're going to have to go through and do that, that is, themselves. Yeah, yeah we, it's a it's a it's a self identification process. Yeah, yeah. That's part of your your design capacity and reporting that you do. It, it's no different than it was before. It's just different criteria. Right. Right. <laughs> We've been talking about design capacity. It's actually trying to identify when waste in place meets a certain volume, right? It's not design capacity. It's in place capacity, right? Yes, I mean, that, that's one of the factors and, that, and that's why smaller landfills typically um, don't fall under the guidelines because they're not hitting that. You can have a huge, large site, but your, your in place waste volume um, isn't there yet, but when it gets there, then it then it would trigger the rules. But now that it's moved from 50 megagrams down to 23, it's just a lot smaller site. Yeah, I think uh, I think Jeff hit on the real thing more than bringing in landfills for active systems. I think you have a lot of smaller sites that may have systems in place, but they're not NSPS systems or odor control systems or they're. Uh, and the monitoring required for them is a lot less than what be re will be required uh, for this. As uh, Jeff mentioned, the penetration monitoring, it sounds kind of weird, but we've been doing it for over a year now in preparation for this rule. And uh, let me just tell you, it, it opens up a whole new world of craziness uh, going around each individual well, each individual condensate collector, each individual leachate riser pipe, every every possible pipe that plumbing goes in and out of the cap of the landfill you got to go and do a, a, a specific monitoring and you know you can get on a well a big site they have hundreds of points but on a uh, even on a moderate or smaller site it's still 50 60 points that require upfront monitoring and and immediate uh remediation if for some reason there's uh, you know, leaking around the pipe or the penetration. So, uh, and Jeff, I think you're, you're on the target. That's, I think that's where the real rubber is going to hit the road. And then the the issue with the the boots, as you were talking about, Jeff, is um, you know typically they're five foot, ten foot uh, square, 
Um, you could still have gas leak outside of that, you know, underneath it and go out to the edges. So it's it's not a, you know, it fixes coming up the annulus of the borehole, but it, um, I, you know, it doesn't address all the things. And, you know, Chuck, to your point, you know, we have some sites that have 400 wells plus, um, and, and it's a huge endeavor. It's like a week to a week and a half just to do the initial surface emissions monitoring. And then you're talking about doing, if you have to do any rechecks, um, you know, it's, it's a significant uh, value. I got a question for you. If you have a closed landfill that closed at the point that their volume was under the previous limit, and now if they had been open, they would be caught, you know, with this new, new limit, this new standard. Are they affected or are they grandfathered out? That's a good question. I don't I don't know that one. I got to get some uh, other information on that. I know if, if you um, we've had some sites where we tested out of it that were NSPS uh, closed sites, uh, mainly because the gas production is diminished, but um, I, I don't know that answer, so I'll try to find what that is. Well, and that's the it applies to landfills that commence construction on or before July 17, 2014. So let's say, I guess, if they didn't do an expansion after 2014, but went into closure, say, in 2016, and I don't think that would apply to them, but I'm, I'm not the, I'm not going to say that's the bottom line of the rule, but I think that's part of the way I understand it is that if it's up and running as of uh, 2014, then yeah, the answer is yes. But if they closed and they hadn't expanded it after that cutoff date, then they would not would not affect them. It's very it's you know, your typical EPA rule. It's very clear and muddy at the same time. I, I think it's it's kind of it's going to go to that way, uh, Holly. I mean, it's going to be just about every site because greenhouse gas has become a huge concern. And uh, I think they're, you know, trying to minimize that as much as possible. And, you know, landfills are uh, one of the larger providers of greenhouse gas. And what the tier two test does for you, it allows you to use a site specific value in that uh, equation as part of that uh, AP 42, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so if your site is has enough low enough uh, emissions, then that will opt you out once you do the tier two testing. For, for up to five years. Yeah, right. And then you have to do it again to see that there hasn't been any change. So my last question, you have to check it in. Is this something you have to do annually then, Scott? The the tier two test or what? Yeah. Yep. No, it's uh well it, it'll depend. So when you um when you get your site specific value, you plug that into the calculation. And then if that calculation will take you out past the five years, then you only have to do that in year five, unless you had a significant change of volume that you're bringing into the site. Um, if it remains to where you were projecting it to be, then you're good. Um, if it tests and you're out at, at three years, then yeah, you have to retest before you, you go out it, or just apply with the rule. Uh, David, I, I think more importantly for your municipal customers is that if they get pulled into the rule because of where they are, then it becomes an ongoing monthly expense that will never go away. Okay. That's what I was really wondering. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, once you're once you're started, it's a it's a expensive operation and it it continues on and on and on. So Thank y'all. Does anyone else have any, any input on that? Like I said, this was just uh, wanted to just throw it out there and just uh, let uh, all the members kind of hear what's going on and what's coming down because it does impact uh, solid waste management in not just uh, Texas, but nationwide and uh, will continue. So Holly, yeah, I Chance. Had, Holly, I had yeah, a Diane. question. Uh, yes, it's kind of a follow up to Reese's about the closed landfill issue. So if a landfill is in, they've closed, they're not accepting waste anymore, but they're in that, you know, post, they have to do 30 year post closure care. So 
if if you know, so they still have their gas system running. So is it when you were saying that about the two four was it two thousand and fourteen or sixteen date? So if they're it may not apply or will apply or There, I, th I think, and you could read that again, Holly, but I think it's if you did uh, an expansion after 2014. And, and I don't have the rule in front of me, so I, I can't really remember where what the, what that says. But if, if you are a closed landfill and you're applicable to NSPS currently, you, you still have to do that throughout post closure until you can demonstrate that you, you don't need that gas system anymore or you don't need to be monitored as an NSPS site. I don't know whether anybody's got an answer to this, but let me just throw out the hypothetical that was on my mind. Let's say you've got a site that closed in 2015. And when they closed in 2015, let's say they were less than 50 megagrams. Let's say they were 40. OK, well, now the standard is 34. What happens to that site? It's closed. Is it now subject to new source performance standards? That that was really what I was trying to get at. So it, it applies to landfills that commenced construction on or before July 17, 2014, and have not been modified or reconstructed since that time. So it sounds like if it, let's say hypothetically, it closed in 2015, opened sometime between 2014, <laughs> and they got, they're now caught in the net, you know, because the standard was lowered. It sounds like that facility, um, the 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 rule now applies to that closed facility. It sounds like potentially, yeah, yeah, and it could, and that that's where that facility. Ouch. I would think if if they're closed since 2015, um, they should be on a diminishing curve of their gas. So uh, that's the the sites I would recommend to do the tier two examples and and try to see where their emissions is and use the site specific. So, so it would it would mean that that site would again have to do the tier two testing to figure out whether they are now caught in the dragnet. Yeah, and you know that tier two test, Risa could up. You know, like I said, if the numbers works and they even run the calculation, they're lower. Then they're they're okay. As yeah. Scott said, you know, the the more time that it's out there, the the uh, less chance that that waste mass is still producing those gases. So, right. And I and I've done a lot of tier two in my careers. It's uh, very rarely are you higher than the EPA um, guidance. Mm -hmm. it, it always seems like it's lower. So it, it's almost worthwhile to do that. Okay. Well, I think. Uh, I think we've wrestled that enough, and uh, I think we'll uh, continue to watch that as uh, as the days and weeks go by. Um, if there's nothing else on uh, on uh, emissions guidelines, we'll go ahead and uh, look at the uh, minutes from the April 21st. I'm sorry, April 8th, 2021 meeting. Uh, those were in the email and on the uh, on the uh, schedule. So. If you could uh, take a moment, if you haven't, and just look at those. And if someone wants to make a motion to approve those, I will entertain that at this time. Holly, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I second. Right, thank you. And uh, Richard, and uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, we'll just ask uh, all those in favor, just indicate by saying aye. 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 Minutes Aye. have been approved. So next item, uh, Diane, I guess, are there any action items that we have on your list? The only action item that y'all requested was uh, Megan giving y'all the scrap tire, and I believe she's already put, sent it to you in the chat. Is that correct, Megan? Megan had to step away. OK, but I think she I, I saw it come across, so. Either we can, she's either we will, sent it. Yeah, if, we can if, also send if it. If you don't have it, we'll resend it. But I think she's she may have already sent it. OK, um, that's the only action item that I had. Great. 
All right, uh, we'll move along. I'll open the floor now to those members of the public that are on the call. Uh, I guess if you have any questions or comments, if you'd like to indicate by raising your hand, and uh, we'll open the floor for those now. And I'm not seeing any hands. I'm not sure if uh, Diane, you or Cody are seeing any that I am not. Uh, so with um, no public comment, I guess we will uh, go ahead and close this meeting. Uh, the uh, next. Uh, Holly, I've got, I've got, I've got one last thing, and I just wanted to uh, confirm. A rumor told me that you are not reapplying for your position on the <laughs> advisory board. Is that still the truth? Well, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, and it's uh, I, I will say, uh, you know, I, it's a six year appointment. And uh, I'm probably going to work a big part of that six years, but uh, didn't want to leave a, a spot open. You know, that's a that's always been uh, uh, a point of contention on the on the council. We have so many slots that that people just disappear. We never hear from them again, and I didn't want to leave because I believe this is an important council and I believe it's, the, it's an important position as licensed professional engineers. And so I didn't want to uh, retire in four or five years and leave a slot open. So I just felt better part of valor to uh, go ahead and step aside and let someone else uh, take it over. And then uh, um, this would be my last meeting. So yes, you heard that rumor correctly. Um, I, just, I just wanted to thank you and congratulate you for your leadership as the president of the council. You've done a fabulous job. And, uh, hats off to you and we're going to miss you. Well, thank you, Chuck. And you would know as you, you've uh, been the president of this uh, many times yourself. And uh, I will probably do like a former council member that's been on the call today, Mr. Hyman. I'll probably slip in from time to time and keep an eye on you guys and make sure that uh, you aren't uh, doing anything that's, that uh, I wouldn't do, but uh, it, it has been something that I've enjoyed really in my career. Um, this is one of those things that uh, has really been a, a highlight and some one that I've really enjoyed meeting with, with all of you folks uh, every quarter. I, I've been really, really sad that we were not together for the last year and a half. I was really hoping that July that things would open up and unfortunately it did not. I will say our Texwana board is uh, stepping up and we're going to have an in-person meeting tomorrow in Dallas at the Dallas Lovefield Conference Center. So uh, we are we are going to begin in-person meetings tomorrow at 10 30 a.m. So hopefully in October the Advisory Council will be in a position to do the same thing and uh, I look forward to hearing from y'all. And like I said, I'm not going away. I'm still going to be actively engaged. I actually will get to be more of an engineer again in my career as I will be handing off more administrative duties and picking up more engineering duties. So I'm actually looking forward to that. I'm going to get back my feet wet into, into the world of solid waste and engineering. And uh, I'm really excited about that because it's been a long time since I've been able to devote all my time to engineering and I didn't have to answer a, well, those of you that do administration, you know what I'm talking about. So it's uh, it can be fun, but it can be a challenge and I'm looking forward to uh, allowing someone else to have those challenges and opportunities. So thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Holly. I guess that's all we've got. So we will adjourn and uh, Look forward to seeing you guys at uh, the Texwana Conference. I'll go ahead and put a little plug in there. It's coming to Lubbock next April uh, 2022 in-person conference. I am the conference chair, so uh, I'd love to see a lot of my friends from the advisory council there to come to the to the hub city and uh, have a great three days of talking trash. So go ahead and throw that out and uh, hope to see you guys there. So if not, I guess we are done and uh, so long. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Holly. Bye, -bye. Yes, thank you, Holly.
Cody, wait till everybody's out before you turn off recording, I guess. Yes, ma'am, that's what I was planning on doing. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Uh, whenever you all have a chance, go ahead and uh, log out of the meeting. <laughs>